and welcome to the Whiskey Sisters podcast. I am Inga Larissa and I am Jennifer Rose. Together we will be bringing you a weekly whiskey podcast where we'll be discovering drams, exploring distilleries, talking to industry experts and sharing other whiskey adventures. Not only will we be sticking our noses into our drams, but also into all things new and current in the whiskey universe, with a leading commentary, of course. A warm whiskey sister's welcome. So welcome back, listeners. This week we have a special guest, Mark Thompson, a.k.a. Single Malt Mark. He is the brand ambassador for Glenfiddich. And he's a keeper of the quake, so we are expecting some juicy whiskey intel. Huge thank you to those of you that have been taking the time to rate, review and subscribe to our podcast. Super appreciated. In fact, Inka, have you read a couple of the latest reviews on Apple Podcasts? An excellent podcast dram. The Whiskey Sisters managed to create a funny and informative podcast on Scotch whiskey. They provide a feminine perspective of an unusual view on whiskey. I love this podcast, which is a real breath of peaty fresh air on this often very masculine subject. I Aww. love it. Thank you so much for that review. And we have another one. Um, hilarious. Love these girls. They just make me laugh on how they crash through the world of whiskey with humour and fun. And it's great to see their journey from tentative novices to insightful commentators, all done with giggle and wicked humour. It reminds me of men behaving badly but with girls and whiskey <laughs> oh, I love that I love men behave badly I used to watch it it was so good oh thank and you and I also like the whole like crashing through whiskey yes <laughs> yeah it's like kind of like crash yeah Indeed. thank you for that amazing review to never fear as always we'll be sticking our noses into the latest whiskey news stick your nose in it Scotland's £84 million a year whisky tourism sector is under threat from government plans to ban alcohol advertising. Boo, the, yes. the consultation, launched late last year, runs until March 9th. As well as banning adverts on billboards and in newspapers and magazines, it also proposes an end to merchandise with alcohol branding, which could mean that we can't have our basic our hoodies with our distillery logos, which I love. And, you know, distilleries and brewery would be unable to sell the glassware or any other stuff with their branding on. And it also suggests drinks firms be banned from sponsoring sporting and cultural events. So what's happened is that more than 100 firms, including Belhaven, Budweiser, Diageo, White & McKee, Brewdog, The Macallan and Tennis Lager, signed an open letter to the SNP and Green Administration urging them not to destroy Scotland's drink industry. The First Minister insisted the consultation was not about doing economic damage to the alcohol industry and it's about making sure they can take responsible steps to protect public health and she added i am aware of the letter that has been sent the consultation of course is ongoing the public health minister will meet with the range of stakeholders over the course of the consultation it's big news isn't it Inca? and has far-reaching implications for the industry yeah they even like going as far as saying maybe you wouldn't be able to have the sign you know the big letters on the side of a distillery that are iconic maybe no signage anywhere say you're on Speyside where there's so many distilleries no signage on the road so you wouldn't be able to find anything which obviously it's not just for the drink industry but like even for tourism side of things you know and a lot of these smaller areas you know yes you know you're from Mull and so on so there's not so much going on necessarily and things like the whiskey distilleries can bring a lot of business I personally hope that common sense prevails and that we don't you know make ridiculous decisions that would impact the industry negatively whilst of course issues with alcohol and you know addiction serious issues that need to be addressed and supported you know at, at high levels yeah but it's it's a really tricky one because obviously marketing is a massive thing and you know we wouldn't be using marketing if it didn't you know work basically mm -hmm. so i can see why they want to attack the marketing side of things it's just, obviously alcoholism is a serious it's a serious issue but if you look at something like finland you know we have the same problems and our alcohol marketing is very limited and you can't even have like advert where you open a can that mm -hmm. with, like it has to be without the sound wow you can't have it. yeah I know it's a very but, difficult one well hopefully we can provide education around alcohol and how it can be enjoyed in a really sensible and healthy way for yeah, people exactly. that are able to yeah Morrison Scotch Whiskey Distillers created of Old Perth blended malt scotch whiskey have announced the release of Old Perth PX hand selected from Morrison Scotch Whiskey Distillers collection of mature single malt Scotch whiskies, the new release has spent its entire life in a combination of Oloroso and PX Sherry Hogsheads and Butts. 
butts, big butts, and I cannot lie. <laughs> <laughs> for the past 15 months it has been mailing in first fill Pedro Jimenez casks from Bottega Jose Miguel Martin in Spain Neil Hendrick sales director at Modison Scotch Whiskey Distiller said through our limited edition range we look to further highlight the influence that different types of sherry can have on whiskey and we are delighted with the results of PX maturation Modison Scotch Whiskey Distillers use a small selection of distilleries in the Speyside region region of Scotland to source their mature single malt scotch whiskey for Old Perth. Yeah, and in fact, uh, if you go back to and listen to episode 22, which is the Highland Park episode, we actually sampled three expressions of Old Perth on the Drum and Fire section. So the original cask strength and the 12 year old. So if you want to find out more about this brand, head over to episode 22. And just a quick last one to finish off the news section is that Woodford Reserve um, has appointed Elizabeth McCall as master distiller, the third in the bourbon brand's 26-year history. McCall, who has been training for the role for over a decade, bloody hell, yeah. will oversee quality and innovation efforts and bring new Woodward Reserve products to the market. She will also lead the brand's special rare bourbon releases, including the master's collection and distillery series. Yeah, well done, Elizabeth McCall. Whoop, whoop. Whiskey Sisters! Who doesn't love a bit of Glenfiddich? The distillery's many releases are popular around the world and, in fact, Glenfiddich was the first single malt scotch to be marketed outside Scotland. Their whisky now accounts for about 30% of all single malt sales worldwide, which is just phenomenal. And also the distillery was one of only six distilleries to continue production throughout Prohibition. So yeah, Prohibition, our previous episode, go and listen to that as well. And check out Picture of Inca dressed all prohibition styly on our social media. It looks so good. <laughs> so Glenfiddich means the Valley of Deer. And when I visited Glenfiddich um, last December, I actually saw quite a few wild deer around the distillery, which was so nice. They were just like running around in the snow. That is gorgeous. So it does make sense. The name makes sense. Also, what I find incredible is that all these years, the distillery has remained independent and family owned. William Grant is quite big these days. It was William Grant who started building his distillery near the river Fiddich in summer 1886 and he quit his job as a manager at Mortlach and decided to make his dreams come true with the help of his wife and nine children. Amazing that is it's just like quite incredible isn't it to think of that legacy. I know they literally built the distillery like a just family and some friends and now look at it amazing yeah. all these years later so let's bring in the Glenfiddich brand ambassador Mark Thompson Mark Thompson Mark we would love to welcome you to the podcast and huge congratulations on your recent award Scotch Whiskey Ambassador of the Year for the third time count it people three <laughs> times the treble what Mark is the secret to your success oh I, I, I wish I knew I was as shocked on the evening as, as I think everybody at my table was thank you for for inviting me along and yeah great introduction I, I was really quite shocked actually because uh, there hasn't been anybody that's won it three times it's amazing huge congratulations and there's some amazing ambassadors out there so as it's such an accolade well there's you know there's a lot of people I look up to and, and hold in high esteem and, and uh, there's a maybe at my age now there's a younger brigade coming through and I remember mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago when I was going up to brand ambassadors and people that I held uh, on, on uh, pedestals in the industry and, and having a chat with them. And now I see kind of pinching myself going, oh, it's, that's me now. Because this 22-year-old yeah. bartender is standing speaking to me and she's asking <laughs> me all about how to get into this world, this line of work. So you kind of know you've been on the planet for a fair time. When, uh, <laughs> that's when the that secret. Becomes, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hang around long enough. And they just, maybe they just are fed up handing it out that's it so that you know they'll, they'll give it to me this last time and they'll, they'll never see me again brilliant <laughs> and well done for staying humble i think i just become an egomaniac if i win something like that three times just like stand aside do you know who i yeah. am the industry is fun and it's a great place and i think that's what keeps me grounded i mean many people would disagree and say i'm a big-headed bastard but <laughs> when it comes to whiskey I, I think i've always had that idea in my head that it's just it's just a 
a drink. And, yeah. you know, we've, we've, we've lots of stories to tell and we've lots of people around the world we want to tell them to. You, you have to stay a little bit humble a little bit. Of course, there's there's camaraderie and there's there's yeah. digging at fellow ambassadors, but never brands, I think. And for when you're in it for long enough, you cross so many different paths and different people. Sure. Yeah. You, you, you kind of get checked if you do get a little bit out of line. I've been so, checked a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start from the beginning. How did you actually get into whiskey and what is your whiskey journey like? I had my first drop of whiskey stolen from my grandfather when I was eight. And it was actually a Glenfiddich. Uh, and I've, oh, I've told no this story way. many times. Yeah, it was a pure malt from the 70s. Fabulous man. Talking about looking up to people. I really respected him. He lived till he was 106. <sighs> he was the oldest man in Scotland for a while and uh, sharp as a tack, incredible. I remember stealing whiskey from him because back then the, the, the labels of Glenfiddich were heavily embossed and quite elaborate, quite lavish. There were lots of golds and reflective foil on the label and I'm sure the designers were paid by the font <laughs> because there's, you know, there's 15 different fonts on each label. But for me, I always saw that bottle as an indication of something quite special. My grandfather didn't drink a lot. He wasn't a big drinker. Mm -hmm. Birthdays, Christmases, celebrations, New Year, that bottle would appear. And so I associated it with high high quality celebration. You know, it was, it was coveted. Um, and I remember pinching it. I don't remember what it tasted like. Awful as an eight-year-old. But I grew up in Dundee, so I, I had a lot of catching up to do with my school pals. They were way advanced. They'd start <laughs> a few years ahead of me. And it wasn't for a number of years until I sort of got into to whiskey and I was working and running bars in Glasgow. Originally from Dundee, I'd moved through to Glasgow when I was about 17. You know, reps would come in and start chatting away. And I actually got into wine first. Uh, I ended up running restaurants in Glasgow and then moving to London. And it was the wine side that really bit me. And, and I yeah. got quite a good knowledge in wine. But I got fed up of having to be a meteorologist at the same time. You got to know a wine and like it. And then the next year, there was an early frost or a rain. And so that wine changed. Oh, of course. And, yeah. it, and for me, it was a bit like, oh, I'm a bit bored of this now. I need... Whiskey was a stable. And at mm -hmm. that time, you know, even Glenfiddich, there, it had quite a small portfolio. So you kind of knew what you got from each distillery. And I'm talking sort of 97, 98 uh, in the early 2000s. So you didn't have what you have today with it. You know, brands maybe having 20, 30 different expressions on the market and different cask finishes. So I sort of thought, oh, yeah, I should maybe get back into whiskies. Over the course of maybe three, four years of steadily drinking whiskey. I uh, had built up my knowledge. I started working for Simon Difford at Class Magazine and spent a couple of years under his tutorship, which was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And that really expanded my mind and opened it up. And it was at a time that was just when these new expressions were coming out. So there was things coming through the door into the office on a daily basis. And you were getting to try them and you were getting to, yeah. to hear the stories about the distilleries. And I, I'd gone to a presentation one day, and this was the turning point in the whole thing. I'd gone to a presentation one day. I won't name who was at the presentation. And there was a drinks brand there to represent. And someone stood up to talk about cocktails. And I was at the back of the room. And within about three or four minutes of this individual starting, to talk I thought I'm bored this is ridiculous is this what it's come to and it was at that point I actually thought I could do this and I could do it better so I set up a business called Dramatic Whiskey and it went out on Groupon and Woucher and all these kind of things and it was basically I'd, I'd reached out to all the contacts I had from working with Class Magazine and saying look I can take your brand into a room of 25 individuals twice a week and teach them about different whiskies and it was quite successful. By the end of that when I left the business it was doing 2,000 people a month. Wow. But it that almost the, sounds like you invented the concept of brand ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was that was out there for quite some time. But I think the style of the way I approach things, I think there weren't many people out there at the same time doing that. There were a couple mm -hmm. of young guys that I still know very well, very good friends of mine. And I'd still watch them doing tastings and going, that was fun. You got all the information across. Everybody had yeah. a good time, but everyone's talking about it. Rather than this boring, stuffy sort of, here's a bottle and here's how it's put together. Yeah. It was more about distillery stories and fun little things that have happened and um, myth busting. Bringing it to life, making it accessible. It's storytelling, not just reading off a sheet. One of the customers, the clients that I had was William Grant and Sons. And I covered quite a lot of their work for a couple of years, actually, mm -hmm. for the whiskey show. And 
I was based in London. Their ambassador at the time was based in Glasgow and they wanted to centralize everything. He just had a new family. He didn't want to continue as an ambassador for them. So he put me up for the job and that was it. And I'm now, I think it's nine years I've been with the with the brand. Amazing. Back in Edinburgh now though. So I, I managed to talk them out of uh, keeping me in London for too long. So you did a really significant history in the industry prior to coming to Glenfiddich. Yeah, probably about a good solid eight years working with many other brands, most of them actually. Uh, now, yeah. now it's quite difficult to keep up with everybody that's bringing stuff on the market. <laughs> I knew them all back then. I could list all the distilleries. Yeah. And, you know, and now I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. That's new, isn't it? Lag. Oh yeah. That, oh, God, yeah, yeah. Ever changing. Torvig. And you just got to keep up on top of it yeah. now. I feel sorry for the new guys coming through. I'm able to just smoke my pipe and put my slippers on. But they have to actually <laughs> work hard now. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, tell us a little bit more about your role now at Glenfiddich. Like, for example, you seem to travel quite a lot. My, my official role is ambassador to Scotland, but I lived in London for 16 years. So I've got lots of contacts down there and did the job for Glenfiddich for four or five years down there. And in that time, I've obviously built up a reputation with a lot of people and whiskey clubs around the world. And it's helped me travel. And also being in the company for this amount of time now, if the global ambassador, Struan, can't make an event or he's somewhere else in the world, I'm usually, because it's UK and you can fly into most places quite quickly, I'm usually the port of call. The easiest way to describe what I do for the company now and the brand is I'm an educator and storyteller. So that educational piece can be anything from press, consumers, customers, Tesco's, just it's so varied. Yeah. Um, mm. And I love it. I love the, the variety that's in the role for there and the opportunity to be able to create things as well. So you know, someone drops me a line on Instagram and says, you know, we're launching a new product. I actually had one for tomorrow night and I can't make it. Do you want to come along, bring a bottle, have a chat, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pour a few drams? You know, it fits in really well with what we're doing. We think we might explore something in the future. It's a nice luxury watch company. The travel has calmed down. So have you encountered any kind of funky drinking habits when you've traveled or like how people drink scotch in different countries? Not so much. I, um, the Norwegians kept me up all day and night. <laughs> I went to, <laughs> to Berlin and didn't see a hotel they just kept me up I went back picked my bag up and got back on the flight um, <laughs> uh, so that's a that was quite a good drinking habit but I'm sitting tonight with a Bovadier so I don't drink neat whiskey all the time I quite like to mm -hmm. mix it up and so yeah I suppose things like coconut water always intrigued me when I first saw that being used maybe about six years ago Asian markets and at first you think coconut water but of course it's not the coconut water we get here it's it's really mm -hmm. nice it's delicate yeah. it's quite it's quite clean and it works really well it just gives this oh. creamy rounded especially to American cask whiskies you know ones that have got the kind of buttery vanilla note mm -hmm. to them already that's beautiful amazing um, I've never heard of that oh well there yeah. you go yeah coconut exactly. water and especially as you know on a hot day that's that's the one to reach for yeah. It's just a different highball. Talking about that kind of stuff, have you tried any of these special waters that are like designed for Scotch whiskey? Do you think <laughs> there is a, do, yeah, you, do you like the concept? Water is important. And it's always been this thing that people have argued for years in the mm -hmm. pub about. What we forget is that in Scotland, we've actually got pretty good tap water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You come up, you, it, so you don't actually need, to, that's why we see it as a strange concept. Why would you do that? There's a jug sits yeah. on the bar and it's fine. It's been sitting out for a couple of days, but it's still fine. When you go to London and I lived there for 16 years and you try the tap water, completely different experience. And I really wouldn't put tap water from London into my whiskies because yeah. they're, they're it's highly yeah. coordinated, it's furry, it's, you know, it's... Oh my God, that's such a good point. I lived in Brighton for years and the water oh, was just shocking. Yeah. And obviously I come from Finland as well, where the water is amazing. So you don't really think about it that way, but that makes much more sense because I've been a bit sn like snitty about the waters. <laughs> but yeah, now I'm so like, I maybe think, I won't. <laughs> I think for places, and I've tried a few, I'm not, I'm not convinced, and I'll say this on the record, I'm not convinced that specific waters from specific parts will work with whiskies that have come from that part of the world. I'm, mm -hmm. just, I'm not, I'm not, I've not, I've yet to be convinced on that. Sure. I, I have tried a couple of brands that have, that have touted that, but I've also tried things like Larkfire, the guys who've got water um, mm -hmm. from the Outer Hebrides. So just very, very pure, clean water. And it's not aimed at someone sitting in the Roseburn in Edinburgh. It's aimed at somebody sitting in the George in London, yeah. you know, where, where a small can of water, if you're going to pay a lot of money for a dram and you do want to water it down, you're either going to have to buy some bottled mineral water or buy it from the bar, but you might as well just get a small can and have that with it. So That makes sense. The more and more I see people, consumers' knowledge, which I think has been aided 
and and built up from people like yourselves, podcasts, but also through the COVID period where rather than a whiskey club hosting a tasting once a month, they were doing them once a week, that people yeah. could just sit at home and go to two different whiskey tastings in a week. So by the end of that month, they'd had eight experiences, eight different drams, eight different master blenders or, or distillery managers talking to them or ambassadors. So the consumer's knowledge has increased a lot. And I hear that from the trade as well. People understand and know what they're talking about, or yeah. certainly to a greater level than they did say five years ago. It's less whiskey geeks, it's just more whiskey consumers and they know what they, they like and they know what they're talking about. For them to be offered something which elevates their drinking experience and it's not bullshit. You can actually say it the more you can take water at the tap and try your dram. But if you're gonna be paying 25 pound for that dram of whiskey, here's a small can for another couple of quid and that'll do your next three whiskeys anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we have likes of yourself in this show, because you always bring something new, something good into the show and just inspire people. And obviously, we have loads of listeners from, as we discovered recently, from 101 countries. So, oh, wow. Yeah, this I'm is... sure there's varying water quality. Through. Yeah, exactly. and, and, and temperatures as well. Yeah. So, you know, even tap water, if you go to a, a hotter country, the tap water is warmer, even if it is potable or drinkable. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't come out like it comes in Scotland where you have to chip the end of the tap to get rid of the icicles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, going back to Glenfiddich. So since 2000, the Glenfiddich has received more awards than any other single malt scotch whiskey in whoop. two of the world's <laughs> yeah, whoop, whoop. in two of the world's most prestigious competitions, the International Wine and Spirits Competition and International Spirits Challenge. So if we talk about Glenfiddich whiskey, why do you think the distillery is doing so well? Why does it stand out so much? It's a good question. And I'll point out as well that Glenfiddich 12 is the world's most awarded single malt. The brand itself carries a lot of accolades, but just Glenfiddich 12 on its own beats everything else. And when that's entered into those two competitions, it's entered in blind and it's entered into a section which is non-age statement to 13-year-old Speyside. Now that encapsulates quite a lot of brands that yeah. are local whiskies, and it's blind tasted and consistently scores highly. And I think, and I've, I've seen this before, I think people have a... a well, in Scotland and maybe a bit of Europe, there is a attitude towards Glenfiddich, which is not as positive as the rest of the world. And I know this as an ambassador. I work in the home country. I know that people see it um, sometimes as a supermarket brand. Right. They don't explore beyond the brand. But when you take the packaging away and give someone the, the dram in the glass and, they, and all they are analysing is the quality of the liquid that's in there, that's when it wins. Mm -hmm. Because the preconceived idea about we purchase and eat and drink with our eyes. As soon as you see something, your brain makes up your mind that you don't like it. So I think the liquid has always been exceptional. Yeah. It's always been a great dram. It's hindered slightly by the attitudes of some and the historic nature of the growth of the brand because it's so popular. And when I do tastings, I say to people, I know Luke Glenfiddich 12, if I take a cork out the bottle and throw it hard enough, it'll hit five corner shops that stock it. And that accessibility, there's maybe been biases to people have. If it's so accessible, it's therefore not as rare or not as special or precious. Exactly. But then if you go out to countries where single malt is still a relatively new addition. I was in Nigeria last year in Lagos and the way they look at Glenfiddich or Asia, if you go to the Asian markets, the way that Glenfiddich is revered, respected, consumed, Assumed, even as simple as that, is totally different. Yeah. Oh, it's Glenfiddich, it's fabulous. And it's, you know, as we see, you know, this is a very established market, Scotland or the UK, a very established market. So people have come up with generational ideas. And when I did my whiskey tastings 15 years ago, quite often I'd put, I'd always have six different whiskies in there. Glenfiddich would be one of them or Balvenie or Grant's. And sometimes I'd start with a Grant's blend under the table and not tell mm -hmm. anyone. <laughs> Line the whiskies up. They think they're, oh yeah. And I had one gentleman come in once and he looked at the lineup. Oh, these are all good whiskies. I all single malt. I don't touch that blended stuff and the first drama I did I think it was uh, a finish I can't remember which one it was but it was when Grant started to do the cask finishing and I watched the gentleman drink it and he said oh, that's good oh that's good and he says and which one's this we're drinking and I said oh it's none of these it's this here and I put the Grants down and he says oh it's a blend yeah <laughs> and the expression on his face really tickled me because I couldn't work out whether he was happy to discover something that he liked mm -hmm. or disappointed that he spent <laughs> loads of money on loads of single malts when he could have been drinking a really good quality blend. Yeah. And, you know, part of my attitude with that sort of tasting is to say to people, you know, stop thinking about the, the brands you just want to drink. People don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Who used to say to me, I don't like Glenfiddich. Oh, which ones have you tried? The green one. Oh, yeah. Green one. You know, when you move out of 
the UK and start to get into, or even just move out of Scotland and start to get into these other countries. The 12 is the, the, the first one that they have access to. And because they've been drinking blends before and they're first moving into single malts and they've invested yeah. and paid a little bit more for it, the attitude is completely different. And we've benefited from that because we've been there consistently to provide a product which, yeah. which is high quality it is available it's available in i think 184 countries now mm -hmm. people recognize it and and they have the confidence that when they buy a glenfiddich it's going to be the same as the last one they tried and it's going to have that consistency and that quality in there <laughs> <laughs> and even the dog agrees yeah <laughs> big up that glenfiddich will. we haven't actually changed the way we distill since william built the distillery and and uh, you know it, it first ran spirit off the still in 1887 it had nothing's changed we've just we're just bigger yeah 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 and how about the experimental series mark do you have you know a favorite release from there and do you happen to know what's next in the series yes and no yeah <laughs> <laughs> experimental series was great it, it really did shake things up for the brand it was our opportunity to look at our warehouses we've been experimenting for decades brian kinsman our malt master has had the freedom the family given the freedom to take a, a a lot of new make spirit every year and start to play around with it and some of them have worked some of them haven't he did a fish cask once to try it and a tabasco cask uh, how was the fish cask and he said terrible and i said i kind of expect it he said but maybe we used the wrong type of fish and that's <laughs> That's that's the kind of attitude you want with experimentation. It might yeah. not be the, the the worst result, but we'll learn from it and move on. And we've Brilliant. had the opportunity to do that. So, you know, the first ones we released, the IPA, the first single malt to be finished in an India Pale Ale cask. Great collaborative experiment with a, a local brewer. Project 20, which is my favourite, because one of the casks I put in there, that was 20 casks from 20 ambassadors. That's cool. And it's a different one as well. So you've got a higher ABV at 47% from memory. Quite heavy on the European oak, uh, mm. which is a sort of different style of Glenfiddich that you maybe expect. And then we had Winter Storm Limited Edition, yeah. which was finished in the Canadian ice wine cask. When you think about it now, the young distilleries have really benefited from trailblazing things like that from Glenfiddich. Because years ago, if you were a young distillery, you just released your first whiskey at three years old. And people would pick it up and go, well, it's not a 10-year-old scotch, is it? And you're like, no, it's not, but we're not trying to be. But it will be It will be in, you know, another seven years' time. But when you look at the young distilleries that are releasing now, they're all using cask finishing. Mm -hmm. uh, very few of them, and even if they do release an inaugural release, which is a sort of, this is our, you know, this is our spirit moving forward. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of releases come out very shortly after that, which is, and now we've taken that spirit and we've softened it a little bit with a red wine cask, or we've put it through a rum cask. And yeah. it was Glenfiddich and Balvenia that started that process back in mm -hmm. the 1980s with David Stewart. Wow. So the experimental series, when we do it as a big brand, we have the opportunity because of our scale to experiment. And if it doesn't quite go right, it doesn't end up in bottle. It's mm -hmm. no great loss. But the ones that do make it through to bottle have been great. Orchard was last year's release, uh, which was a, a Pomona cask. Quite interesting, almost like a Pomo or a kind of like a Pinot de Chiron, but using cider instead of um, wine and cognac. It uses cider and uh, Calvados. But it sounds like a perfect highball. Slightly higher ABV at forty three percent as well, which a lot of people are always asking for. Yeah. It, it. Coming forward, I don't know. I was at the distillery in September and saw many casks that were potential experimental releases mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the ambassadors get to try them we give them feedback we know what will work for our various markets whether it's a nice juice at all and then from there they have to look at the logistics is it a product that can continue to go if it takes off winter storm was very popular but the family who did the ice wine in canada and in, in niagara when we went back and said this is great we need these this number of casks they went oh we could never make that amount of wine so yeah. this has to end mm -hmm. so there's lots of little logistics you can come up with a good idea but it's whether it will actually become a commercial product and, and exactly end up on a shelf. does that mean that once the silk is out on on the winter storm that's it oh it's or... been out for quite some time we had <gasps> we had a slight issue with the bottles at one point and there was a, there was a pause in production and we brought out a second batch when we managed to, yeah. to work everything out and we couldn't we couldn't get the casks from oh. so yeah that's no longer 
Oh no, that's like I'm. I'm just thinking like Maria from the uh, Whiskey Girls Finland because she she's always raving about us. Like Maria, if you're listening, stock up, stock up. <laughs> uh, do you know I had the girls across to um, one of the best trips I think I've ever had at Glenfiddich, and I've been there many many times. And they arrived. I arrived exactly the same time their car did. I drove up from Edinburgh, and they came out the car, and everybody's really happy to meet in person. And I said, so um, where have you been in Scotland before? And they, all three of them said this is our first trip to Scotland and therefore <laughs> yeah. our very first distillery trip in Scotland and it's like wow yeah. that's major points for an ambassador you know that's advocacy for life so Maria and the girls are um, we keep in yeah. touch they're, they're such a such good energy I think a piece of their hearts are all still at Glenfiddich so yeah. <laughs> we actually couldn't we couldn't have done better it was autumn the, the entire countryside was auburn and red mm, it was gorgeous. just incredible so nice and we drove around the back of Balvenny Castle and of course, they're like, oh my God, is it an actual castle, ruined castle? I said, yeah, it's 14th century, I think. And then as we turned around, there's a little four bedroom cottage sitting on its own next to the barley field, completely isolated from everything, about 150 metres from the castle. And I said, oh, by the way, that's where you're staying tonight. <laughs> and Santa started crying. She's like, Aww. this is just incredible. I hadn't planned it, but behind the cottage is a field of Highland cattle <laughs> and they were nowhere to be seen. So I, did, I thought I'll not mention it, but just as we were taking the luggage out of the car to get them into their accommodation, a car pulled up and it was the farmer and he brought a bag of feed and seven Highland cattle came up to be fed with a calf. And that, all three of them were just... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's it. Scotland on the tin all it was. It, I couldn't have. I couldn't have planned it. I couldn't have well, planned it better. That's quite funny because I was at Glenfiddich in December, just the week before Christmas, and it was snowing. It was so beautiful. And we did a little walk and saw loads of animals, highland cows, cows, deer, like everything and everyone's like oh this is not planned this is not planned but it's like it started to sound it like it is <laughs> That's a... so while we're still talking about the experimental series so fire and cane actually uses peated whiskey yes. and i did try some peated expressions when i was at the distillery and they were so so good are there gonna be any peated bottles i think it's something we're exploring a lot more glenfiddich when it first started was peated most of Speyside was because it was the easiest fuel to use to dry your barley so process Anybody whose distillery was built early 1800s into the mid 1900s, 1930s, peat was still readily used as the, the, the fuel to dry your barley. So there would have always been a peaty note to a Speyside whiskey. When the rail lines started to come in around Speyside, then alternate fuels were, were not only available, but cheaper. So Glenfiddich was still using peat to dry the barley up until 1954 or 1956, but mostly had switched over, typically after prohibition in America, because a lot of American casks came in. And up until that point, we were using a lot of European oak. So not only would Glenfiddich have been peated, but it, there would have been a lot of sherry cask used or Madeira and port. So it would have been a very different offering mm -hmm. to what we know today. And then in the 1930s, it switched slightly to uh, using a bit more American oak because it was slightly, again, cheaper. And the style changed. Then we switched to smokeless fuels around that time as well. So when Brian Kinsman took over as malt master, he asked the family if he could start bringing in peated malt. Now, I'm actually drinking a, a, a Glenfiddich from the early 2000s called Koran Reserve. Koran's a reference to the burning embers in a fire, with the, a peat fire in particular. And it's a very lightly smoked Glenfiddich 12-year-old. But we weren't doing peated malt through Glenfiddich at that point, so it's actually a slight cheat. It's Glenfiddich 12-year-old that's rested for a few months in a, an Isla cask, and it gives it this really lovely top note of peat rather than a, a, a sort of earthy, complete peat through the palate. But Brian had said, look, we, we would like to start using some spirit. So we started getting peated malt in, lightly peated, probably about, I think it's 36 ppms we bring in, putting it through the process. And he's been putting, he's been laying it down for years. So Fire and Cane was the first release that we did, which was actually peated malt that had come into Glenfiddich peated and been right through process. I would certainly say there's going to be more. The Spirit of Speyside Festival bottling last year, there was a 13-year-old red wine cask and there was a 14-year-old peated variant as well. 
which yeah, is I wonder if that's the one that I tried, but it was really, really good. I actually went for seconds. <laughs> yeah, it, it <laughs> was a, an it. American, it was a bourbon, refill bourbon cask from memory at about 59% ABV, 58% ABV. Winter Storm, although that's a limited edition, the part of our grand series, the Grand Cru, the 23-year-old, which is finished in a, a cuvee wine cask, that's very similar. And a lot okay. of people that tried Winter Storm and really liked it have really gotten on board with Grand Cru. It is a shame winter storm is finished it had a slightly yeah. thicker it was a bit more viscosity to winter storm if you loved winter storm that's the one to go for Grog crew okay good tip that is a good tip because there'll be a lot of people looking out for that yeah you are actually the third keeper of the quake that we've had in the show again another huge accolade congratulations for that that it just meant so much to me it, it, <laughs> it really did you have to be in the industry for 10 years or more and show that you have provided a significant contribution to the world yeah. of whiskey. I, I, you know, I was there at, at waiting, and this, this is bonkers. There's a woman in front of me who I know really well, and we're waiting in line to go up. And I tap her on the shoulder and I said to her, I can't believe you're not a keeper. And she said to me, I can't believe you're not a keeper. I said, well, I'm really honoured to be keepered at the same time as you. And that woman was Rachel Barry. Wow. <laughs> That's I just, amazing. I, I just... I just couldn't believe it. You know, it's, I think there's only, it's been going 30 years mm -hmm. and I think there's only something like 3,200 keepers in the world. So yeah, that was a very humbling moment. I, I was in a, yeah. I was in company that I felt the, the full imposter syndrome hit hard that night. <laughs> it, really, it really did. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about people, but you know, I have to mention some dogs. Um, when I was at Glenfiddich, Brian, the malt master you mentioned earlier, he told me about these two red-haired cocker spaniels, Kevin and Toby, who I actually featured on my recent blog post, little blog there. So they basically sniff every single cask owned by William and Grant and Sons to find the bad casks, basically, so they can be removed from the circulation. So have you met these two guys? I haven't yet. No, they're down in Gervin. I haven't had the pleasure of, of meeting them. I need to take my dogs down and just cause mayhem. <laughs> my dogs would just chew casks apart, whether they were good or bad. <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be no discrimination there at all. They just wrecked the place. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really interesting thing. And, and uh, they're a great addition to the team. I've watched previous dogs that we've had there working on video and it's incredible you know the oak has started to take on too much water or it's rain damaged or its previous contents has not worked very well so whatever there's a number of different reasons where the oak starts to not give out the best aromas and you don't want to put your spirit in there and the dog will pick it out in a heartbeat it's, it's amazing cool. isn't it so clever great to i know it's amazing and like Apparently, when they have their working vests on, they're in the zone, they ignore everyone, they just do their job. And as soon as the vest is off, they're super happy and cuddly and social dogs. I yeah, love it. It's, uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's nice to, to work with a company that will happily look at those types of things as well. There's two million casks sitting at Gervin. I think it's approaching three, actually. There's two million casks sitting at at Dufton. That's a lot of work. They see it as a game, which is the great thing about it. It's just a game to them. <laughs> so they, they are over the moon to be involved in doing it. Adorable. So Mark, you've been super generous with your time, but we must ask you a final question before you go. And we would like to know your dream dram. So if you were able to share a whiskey with a celebrity, either dead or alive, who would it be and why? And what dram would you choose? There's two people that I, I really couldn't choose between them. And they're, okay. both, hell, they're both absolute hell raisers. Rock and roll. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, neither of them are rock and roll, actually. Uh, <laughs> Oliver Reed. Uh, oh, amazing. I read quite a bit of work around Oliver Reed in my early teens. He just seemed old school, of course, and a bit of a hell raiser, perhaps not an individual that would be viewed very positively in today's world. But for his time and yes, his it acting. Yes, of his time. Mm -hmm. Of his time and his acting. And the other one, for similar reasons, was Hunter S. Thompson, because I read yeah, lots choice. of his books, lots of his books when I, was, when I was young. And it fascinated me, that archaic, destructive personality 
Mm-hmm. which um, I'm drawn to a little bit. Yeah. I, quite, I quite like those individuals that are like, let's go, mm. let's just <laughs> fuck it all, let's go. <laughs> Whiskey fueled, of course. So it would be a choice between the two. I think maybe Ollie, because Hunter was a bit of a recluse, so I, I, it wasn't great at interacting with other people. There's a, <laughs> there's a thing called the Wimbledon 8, there's eight right. pubs around Wimbledon Common. And apparently the thing to do is to try and... The, the challenge, and it was Oliver Reed's challenge, was you had to walk to each one of these eight pubs and have a pint in each one. And you had half an hour to have your pint and then walk to the next pub. And he used to do it twice. And no one could ever make it twice. <laughs> just things like that. I just think I'd love to go on and do the, the Wimbledon eight with Oliver Reed. And if I was going to take a dram in particular, I think it'd probably be that pure malt from the 1970s that I had with my grandfather. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Um, actually, I did a, a, a Norwegian whiskey t- group were over in Speyside recently, and they'd asked specifically if I could do a tasting for them in Elgin. I was like, yeah, no problem. I'll catch up. I happened to be in the area anyway. And I took one in, and I, t- I hadn't dealt with the bottle for maybe a couple of months, and I certainly hadn't used it in a tasting. And I hadn't told the story about my grandfather. And, and these are all big, burly Viking-type guys. You know, they're <laughs> bounding in, and they're, oh, they'd all been on distillery tours, and had hundreds of pin badges on, and they were all men, and slapped me on the back. And I felt very intimidated and small, <laughs> meek of nature. I started to talk about the significance of this bottle, and it just caught me. And, I, and I've talked about it so many times, whatever it was, Mm-hmm. Hard week, I'd been tired, or a certain memory that had popped into my head, but I had to stop the tasting. I had to, I had to. It was a myself. chin wobbling moment. It was a big one, mm-hmm. and I thought, oh, God, not in front of these guys. But actually, I think <laughs> that you know, it maybe added or helped tell the story of of that mm, bottle. I'm sure it did. To me. And it's not an, you know, it's not an expensive bottle, and it's an eight year old Glenfiddich. It says it on the label, over eight years old. Moments if I'm going to sit down with someone and really have a good connection then it doesn't have to be the most expensive and it doesn't have to be the most lavish or the rarest it just has to mean something and that can be from a hip flask with a blend or it can be from a crystal glass with a 30 year old i think that's such a lovely example of the unifying connecting nature of whiskey and our individual and collective stories of it which is so beautiful Mm, absolutely great ending beautiful (laughs) thank you so much for your time mark we do really appreciate you you know taking that time for us it means a lot yeah and hopefully next time we can we can share a dram in person well let's do that let's make sure i'll try not to cry (laughs) (laughs) and if you can't be bothered we understand because it's draining meeting loads of people (laughs) (laughs) no i actually i actually do i actually do enjoy i'll not drink at a glen cairn though that's the funny thing when i'm at home you'll see i've got i've got everything except a glen cairn i've got three different glasses because if i pick up a glen cairn it makes me feel like i'm working yeah Yeah. the associations so it's anything just usually out of the bottle if i'm at home actually (laughs) (laughs) thanks so much for having me on it's been a blast it's been really nice speaking to you Dram on fire. So today we are sampling Glenfiddich 18, which comes at 40% APV. And apparently they marry the 18-year-old in small patches of no more than 150 casks. And it's a combination of Oloroso sherry and bourbon barrels. I'm going back to it just now because it's been in the glass for a little while. And I actually feel a little bit annoyed because I've not given myself as much time as I would have liked to, to really get involved in this Glenfiddich. But some impressions were nice, light gold golden colour. Yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking light amberish. Yep. Yeah. Very nice. And on the nose, I was getting pears poached in wine. I was getting walnut sponge cake. Mm. Gentle floral aromas, you know, like just kind of wild flowers, nature smell, like summer meadow vibes. Yeah, actually, that's funny. When I first was noticing it, I was kind of going between uh, maracino cherry syrup and those pink cocktail cherries, but also yeah. that kind of perfumed floral feel oh yeah yeah nice anything else no that was all i got on the nose with air because at first it was quite sweet and perfumed i think and then with air it was getting a bit more citrusy like you know orange oil that you mentioned previously you know when you you get the oil from the skin Mm -hmm. and also when you peel like a fresh mandarin so that kind of smell yeah with some cinnamon and i was getting a little bit dark chocolate and coffee and then it was with air it was getting a bit fusty like a basement fustiness 
Well, like, that's weird you're saying that because I've not got too much in my glass now, but as I'm nosing now, I can get a wee bit of fusty. Yeah, but like, you know, that kind of nice, that with the older whiskey, sometimes you get that kind of, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, it's kind of nice mix of aromas there, I think. Like a kind of damp barn shed smell. Yeah. Cellar. Yeah. The palette, at first, I think it started as like oaky kind of woodiness, but then again, I was getting those sweet cherries from the nose and I was thinking the cherry bake will tart oh, that's exactly what i've got almonds and cherry baked will tart ah, amazing yeah delicious and there was definitely some spice like nutmeg and it was almost a little bit salty ah my i got a kind of spiciness you know crystallized ginger that's gonna kind of got like a little zing but quite sweet as well yes definitely there's definitely dried fruit like i i was thinking dried apricots i love mm-hmm. those like oh mm-hmm. those delicious but yeah dried ginger that's a good call good shout and kind of orchard fruit kind of generally on the palate for me yeah i was i was getting also a little bit citrus in there too mm-hmm. so it was becoming a bit more citrusy a bit more savory like salty I, I couldn't figure out what the salty feeling was yeah because it was kind of like a tangy it wasn't like spicy it didn't make me think of any of your usual like black pepper or anything like that it was just i don't know i've always loved this dram like when i mm-hmm. first got into whiskey when i wasn't maybe that confident or didn't know yeah. too many whiskeys but yeah. i always felt like found comfort in Clinfordic 18. Oh, that's lovely. I mean, it's really, it just goes down really gently. It's smooth, isn't it? I think it's like on the finish, I think there's a nice, a little bit oakiness for me, but still kind of quite light and fruity. Yeah, yeah. I always kind of wish some of these would be just a slightly higher on the ABV. ABV, so you, yeah. Yeah, you would get a little bit more texture or just like something. I I don't know. I have fond feelings about Clinfordic. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> it's funny though, what Mark was saying earlier about the 12 year old I don't I don't I'm not actually sure if I tried it that's definitely something I will probably order next time I'm in some bar just because that's the award-winning one and yeah and you can't argue with that blind tasting that's pretty that's excellent isn't it that it's coming in so strongly in blind tastes without you know any preconceived ideas or expectations exactly definitely gonna give that a try okay so next one i had this sample which is the 14 year old single cask it's a red wine cask and it's 60.2 percent abv i kind of wanted us to this is not something you can actually buy it's just something i got from the distillery when i was visiting there and and we got these really cute tartan hip flasks when we did a little walk in the snow and they were filled up. They're quite big hip flasks, actually. So anyway, so it was really cold. We were in the snow and then we stopped, just had a dram. We were all kind of cold and so it was really nice and warm and it just tasted so good. So I thought, oh, we should just feature this as well. Why not? But now when I'm going back to it, I'm like, it's nice. It needed a lot of time in the glass and I even added water to it, to be fair. But it's not like blowing my socks off. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think so much of it for you was the whole entire experience yeah, and the warming nature totally. of it? Exactly. And the color was crazy. It was it's so dark. Coca-Cola color. Yes, exactly. That's good. Coca-Cola. I just wrote like brown, like mahogany, but it's definitely Coca-Cola. Yeah, for sure. It's like super dark. I've got to say I'm loving the nose on it. Again, I've not had too much tasting time, so I've spent more time on the nose than tasting, but I love it on the nose. Yeah, funny thing is, when I first started nosing, I was like, I'm not getting anything on the nose. And wow. I was thinking, oh, did I ruin it? Did I do something to it? It's just been in my glass for ages, and the nose is actually really nice. Really nice. I've got soft leather gloves. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I love that smell. <laughs> it's a good smell, isn't I it? I actually really like that smell. Soft, chewy toffee, like really nice kind of caramelly toffee. Super luxurious homemade fruitcake. My mum makes awesome fruitcake and like with plump cherries, like just like mm, juicy, juicy. Toffee sauce and that kind of mocha cake, you know, coffee, chocolate cake type of thing. I could nose that just all day long, not even bother having a sip. I'm so happy that it's evolved because I was just, I was so sad when I started nosing. I was like, oh no, there's no smell. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, See, I was so desperate that I actually added water. Inca, that's so not like you. What (laughs) happened when you added water? Not much, but like, it's literally just the air that's done the trick I think the palate was very warming tons of licorice and like salty licorice soft licorice 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 I don't think you'll like that because you don't like licorice not really and it's I quite like salted caramel and I can get saltiness but it's a bit too strong 
you yeah, know that that is like it's very it's almost like I want to say tangy and it's not got the savouriness like you know an like a super savoury Isla Peaty dram, but I kind of want to veer towards fishy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I was thinking like something burnt, like caramel or, yeah, imagine like really burnt fish kind of smell. Maybe I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. Like, but maybe like aniseedy anyway. Yeah, definitely aniseedy. But it's funny because how I remember it when I was trying it on the in the snowy day you know I remember thinking oh this is like I could get the the red wine it was kind of yeah it was more juicy it was also very cold so I, I was going to say you wonder, how, uh-huh, you wonder how the temperature impacts the whole your the whole sensory experience yeah, and exactly. the drama itself. I think it probably would have kind of kept all the no the I don't know like have a chemical impact obviously yeah. for not releasing as many tasting notes on the finish there's something kind of like super wood shavingy woody workshop but thick treacliness on the yeah, finish it's quite interesting actually i quite like the experiment but i will definitely see if i can find out how would they use this cask or where did it go so maybe eventually we get hand on some like some of the bottles or i don't yeah. know to see I'm, what comes of it it's quite a fascinating dram. The colour alone is just kind of crazy. Yeah. And on the nose, as I say, I could just happily nose that, but not mm. so much on the sipping. Thank you for sharing that sample, Inca. You're welcome. Whiskey Sisters, Whiskey Fact. This week, it's only fitting that we will be bringing you some facts about Glenfida. The triangular bottle shape represents the three ingredients, water, barley and air. The bottle was originally designed in 1956 by the famous modernist Hans Schleiger, who was also behind the iconic London transport bus stop signs. Glenfinnick started to use the bottle from 1961 when they launched their straight malt. Mm, It's definitely a different style of bottle. Yeah. Glenfiddich was the first Scottish distillery to export and market its whiskey as single malt. First single malt from Scotland. It was first marketed as straight malt and pure malt to indicate that the spirit came from one distillery and mm-hmm. only contained malt. Eventually, it evolved and changed into single malt. So they were the first single malt, Scotch. Com- yeah, complete pioneers. Yeah, amazing. That deserves respect, doesn't it? Yeah, hats off. May your glass be full and your dram on fire. We would love to hear about your experiences when it comes to Glenfiddich in general. Feel free to slide into our DMs and share your thoughts and recommendations on their whiskies or any experiences you'd had with them. We would love to hear it all. Definitely. Yes, give us a follow on Instagram at Whiskey Sisters Podcast, Twitter at Whiskey Sisters, and Facebook at Whiskey Sisters Podcast. Next week, we will be talking about Puni Italian whiskey. Have I said that correctly? Yeah, Puni. Puni. Yeah. Oh. Bella Bella. Until next week then. Ciao. Bye sugar. See you then. Bye.